The walls of this imposing building, which started its life out as our Selbridge Workhouse, our Poor Law Union, are over 180 years old. Its stories are many and varied. Synonymous with dread, despair and often death, particularly during the famine years, the building has other stories too. It was a place of refuge for some, a place where love was found and for one great wealth acquired. So please come with me and let these walls tell their stories. Before the blight arrived in Ireland in 1845, bringing with it death and destruction to the population, Ireland was a country heaving with a population of over 8 million. In today's records of 2020, it shows our population stands at about 5 million. Men and women in Ireland pre-famine married young and had large families, but they existed mainly through agriculture on small holdings. The arrival of the lumper potato in the early 1800s from Scotland was welcomed by Irish people as an absolute godsend. It could grow in poor soil and give good yieldings. An adult man or woman would eat approximately 14 pounds of potatoes a day. However, poverty was rife and Ireland being governed as a colony of the British Empire, their government saw fit to send a gentleman called George Nichols over to our country for a few weeks to see and comment on the state of the poor in Ireland. As a result of his visit in 1836, the British government decided to adopt the English system of dealing with the poor and destitute. The country of Ireland was divided into 130 unions, with at least one workhouse in each union. Kildare, however, had three, one in Athai, one in Nace and one here in Selbridge. The architect was Mr George Wilkinson and he was paid £500 sterling a year to design and build all the workhouses. Some of his actual plans of Selbridge workhouse were found in its walls and they are such a treasure to have. These workhouses were to be bleak and bare. They were to be a place of last resort. When the large wooden gates and doors opened in 1841, no one could foresee the devastation and utter poverty that was to result with the coming of Angertha Moor or the Great Hunger. Between 1845 and 1850, one million people would die of disease and starvation and another two million would leave our shores forever in one way or another. Life in the workhouse was meant to be harsh and totally unforgiving. Only the absolute desperate would end up banging on the doors to be allowed inside. When a family arrived at the door, they were met by the relieving officer and given a ticket. Then they were medically examined, their rags were removed, they were bathed, and then the families would be separated. This was the very most important reason why every person in the country never ever wanted to set foot inside the house. If a mother had a child under two, she was allowed to keep that child with her, but over two, the little girl or little boy was sent to the dormitories for the girls or boys. Can you imagine how traumatic that was? Up until the age of 15, these children remained separated and regarded as children, but once they reached the age of 15, they were then regarded as adults. Young boys and men would spend their days in the yard breaking stones and the gravel would be used for roads. They would sew mail bags from hard, harsh material called hessian. The women would sit picking oakum, which meant they unrolled ropes and picked the tar off the ropes with their bare fingers. Within an hour, they would be bloody and sore. The younger girls would look after the babies and wash the linen. A strict rule of silence was to be followed and always obeyed. A 
a bell would ring at 6 a.m. every morning. All would rise except for those who are very ill or those who had died during the night. People slept in their dormitories, both male and female, in rows lying shoulder to shoulder on straw pallets. When one turned, all turned. This gave rise to incidents of typhus and cholera. There is an old story that the priests of Selbridge were so petrified of catching the disease that when they came to baptise the babies in the workhouse, the babies would be passed out through a hole in the wall. Once the bell was finished ringing, the footsteps would echo down the stone stairs as the women and men made their way to their dining rooms for breakfast. Those stone steps are now gently worn with 180 years of bare feet. Over the stone stairwell, there were ventilation shafts because the Board of Guardians reckoned cold air would be good. In fact, it left the poor people so cold during the winter months. Once in the dining room, they had their breakfast, which was a gruel, a watered down porridge, which had to be eaten in the strictest of silence. Their evening meal consisted of soup made from Indian meal with maybe a slice of bread. For many, this would be the last and only time they would catch sight of their children and other members of their family in the day. It was a harsh existence. The worst of the famine years was 1847, and that became known as Black 47. Hundreds were buried in the famine graveyard, which is attached to the workhouse. A cart with a hinge on the end would tip the unfortunate into a mass grave, which would then be sprinkled with lime. In 2007, the famine graveyard was restored by the Tidy Towns Committee and a beautiful seven metre high sculpture by Jarleth Daly was unveiled. At the top, four doves fly north, south, east and west and represent the freed souls of those who passed. Now that the famine is well and truly over, the workhouse was being used as a refuge, a place for those who had nowhere else to go. Its address was Big Lane, but that would change in the next census of 1911 and become Union Road. It housed 154 inmates and was run by a mother superior and five nuns from the Sisters of Charity. One of the men, in the workhouse was a 59-year-old gardener from New York City. He was a widower, maybe he fell on bad times. Several of the inmates were from Galway and all could speak both Irish and English. The New York Times posted a story in 1906 about a vast estate called the White Estate, which was in New York, and they were trying to trace the descendants. They eventually, the solicitor who was involved traced the man who was called James Nolan to Selbridge Workhouse and he was satisfied that he was the descendant and the inheritor of this fantastic estate. What an unbelievable story. With the outbreak of the Great War, Selbridge Workhouse was to become a place of safety and refuge for Belgian refugees who were fleeing from invading Germans. The Selbridge refugees arrived on October the 23rd, 1914. Belgium and Ireland had always been close. Belgium was a small country and so were we. It was predominantly Catholic and so were we. There was huge excitement in the village and every window in Main Street had the Belgian red and black flag. 34 people travelled out from Dublin to the workhouse. Now let me tell you, under no circumstance were they to be treated like the inmates already in the workhouse. The Belgians could wear their own clothes and they were allowed to cook their own food. A week before Christmas, 22 wounded soldiers arrived in Selbridge. The youngest was only a lad of 17. 
The wealthier families of the area wanted to make Christmas as happy a time as possible for the Belgians. Mrs Barton, who lived in Straffen House, sent over turkeys for the Christmas dinner. The Kildare Observer of the time said they had everything they needed for a lovely feast. Mr O'Brien, he lived in Selbridge Abbey, he sent over a piano and also arranged for some of the more able-bodied men to have a night out at the theatre in Dublin. But two young people who arrived at Selbridge Workhouse were hiding a secret. Irma and Gustav came to Selbridge Workhouse as refugees from Belgium. They were young. They were weavers in Ghent before the war. When they came to the workhouse, they came as brother and sister. But they weren't. They had a secret. They were deeply in love. The secret was too much to bear. So they came here to St. Patrick's Church and spoke with our priest and he agreed to marry them. It was a wondrous occasion and the Board of Guardians heard about it and allowed them enough money to go to Dublin for a one night honeymoon. In the midst of so much strife, this was just a wonderful, wonderful story. On a sadder note, one of these refugees would never make his way back home. This man was Jean de Coyque. Before the war, he was a painter and he was married with five children. While in the workhouse, he became very ill and he died on the 16th of February, 1915. He is buried here and his grave was bought by the workhouse master, Mr Paisley. He was sadly missed by his family and his funeral was attended by a large crowd from Selbridge and also his friends and colleagues from the workhouse. After his death, the autopsy showed that he had contracted typhoid. Thankfully, he was the only victim in the workhouse to suffer from this dreadful disease. For one of the refugees, Jean de Coyk, a little corner of Selbridge would be his forever home. We have now walked through the corridors, the stairwells and the rooms of this building from 1841 and now we are up to 1918. With thousands of soldiers returning from the war, many believe that this is how the influenza epidemic or the Spanish flu, as it was commonly known, came to Ireland. Kildare suffered the highest county rate of death from influenza per head of population. The workhouse in Selbridge now opened its doors as an infirmary to those ill with the virus. 108 people would die of influenza in the workhouse from 1918 to 1919. One family from the village had lost their father at the front during World War I. Now another tragedy would befall the family. His two daughters, aged eight and four, were to die in the workhouse from the Spanish flu in February of 1919. Their cousin Charles, aged 13, had died the previous October. Ads in newspapers of the day looked for further nurses as the infirmary was so full. The workhouse also had a small part to play in the turbulent beginnings of the new state, which started in 1922. The building was taken over by the newly formed Free State Army and it was used as a temporary barracks and recruitment centre. This in turn led it to be attacked several times and part of it was actually burned by the anti-treaty forces. Paddy Milani, 
who was a leader of the old IRA in Maynooth area, he remembered years later that the workhouse was where the first army uniforms were worn. In fact, he said in an interview that Michael Collins came out to see the soldiers, all 35 of them in their new uniform. And this battalion marched into Dublin and met up with others and were part of the relieving or the taking over of the Beggar's Bush army barracks. An ordnance survey map for the year 1939 shows that the workhouse was now owned by a company called the Union Mills Paint Factory. Part of the grounds of the workhouse had also been allocated for a guard the barracks and that barracks is still here today. In 1950, like so many others, Ronan O'Connor left Ireland and went to the USA to find work. But unlike many others, Ronan made it home again. And just a few years later, in 1953, using leading edge paint technology, he founded Colour Trend Paints in the old workhouse building and he revolutionised paint forever. The company is still family run, it has expanded and improved and its products have become global market leader in paint products. I'm now off to meet Kevin and Rachel. They are the current custodians of this building. Your father became involved with the company after a circuitous route through America and back home. And can you tell me about that story? Absolutely, uh, Cathy, and it's great to see you again. See, my father uh, studied chemical engineering in UCD and he graduated in 1950. Um, and he would have known of Spence and Docker working a paint company here because they were renting it from his father. Um, but he, my dad then went to the US and lo and behold, he found a job in San Francisco in the paint industry. And, I, and he worked there for three years and they asked him to go to Mexico to start a new branch of the paint company in San Francisco. And he thought to himself, well, if I'm going to go to Mexico to start a new factory, why, do I, why don't I go home to Ireland and start it? And my dad always wanted to come home again. So after just three years in the States, he came home in 1953 and uh, he met Mr. Spence again. Mr. Spence was quite elderly and said, would you like to take over my business and, or would you like to run Spence and Docker? And my dad said, no, he wanted to do his own thing. But he ended up acquiring the lease from uh, Mr. Spence and Mr. Spence also sold him all, all the equipment. And the rest is history, as they say. And now we're coming to your involvement with the company. Can you tell us about that? Well, my dad started the business in 1953 and my mom and dad lived in a small little house that was on the premises here. It was a two roomed house and my eldest sister was born actually here. So, um, yeah, there was a great grow for the for the family workhouse. Then they bought a, um, a house in Lucan. So I really grew up in Lucan mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I remember as a young boy coming down uh, many, many times um, with my dad and seeing a small, very small business slowly, slowly grow. And the company was and still is a family company. And now we're going into the third generation of the family with your daughter, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a wee bit about that? Yes, Cathy. My dad wor worked from 90, started in 53 and he worked until 1983. Um, and I joined the business in 83 and we had kind of a year together, but he was keen to retire then. And so I've run it from 1983 to uh, 2020. And uh, that's when Rachel, my daughter, who also did engineering, I did chemistry. Uh, so we've all been technical, but Rachel took over uh, last year. So we've now the third generation and almost 70 years old mm -hmm. as a company. But one of the things we love is the, the workhouse, the building, it's phenomenal. Hi Rachel, when you were a little girl, your mother or your grandmother used to take you here to the company on a Saturday. What are your memories of that? 
Yeah, my parents used to work every second Saturday at the shop and um, we were open for a half day and they'd bring my sister and I here um, just to play while they worked and we would run around the warehouse, we'd play hide and seek between the pallets and, and play in the offices as well. So they'd be probably my earliest memories of being with, in the workhouse. So Rachel, you've always loved history right from the very beginning. Can you tell me about your love of it and how you went through education to end up being part of this great company? Yeah, I've always loved history and almost studied it in, in college as well, but ended up going down uh, the engineering path instead. Um, growing up, we actually had a, a book of Selbridge history within the house and the, the Selbridge workhouse would have been a chapter within there. And I love flicking through it, looking at the, the blueprints for the site and then actually being able to come, come and visit the, the workhouse and walk through it as well. And um, yeah, it's always been a passion of mine. Rachel, you're the third generation of your family to run this company but you see yourself rather than an owner of the building as being a custodian of the building how do you what are your hopes and your dreams for moving forward with this company in this very special building yeah i, I would kathy um i think it's it's a building with a really sad history and i think through um through the work that we've done with you and the research that you've done we've learned about the the stories of the many people who passed through and those who never left as well so um, I think I think I and I think my family have a great respect for um, that heritage and I think a lot of our people would feel that way too. That's wonderful Rachel, thank you so much for allowing us to view the building and enjoy your company great. Thank, thank you. you.